Podcast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is a cold Saturday morning here in North Carolina, and this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Jeremy Clevenger Fitness, who we featured on episode 145. Now, if you haven't heard that episode yet, I encourage you to go back and take a listen, especially if you are struggling to get and stay in shape as a busy leader. Well, I hope you're having a great day and I hope you're keeping warm. I have a quick question for you. Do you listen to these episodes on audio or have you tried watching them on video? If you haven't tried watching these videos yet, I encourage you to give it a try. We have a growing following now on YouTube, so head on over there and check it out. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I have another great show lined up for you today, but before we get started, I just want to remind you to take a look at the leadership books on my website. I've written three leadership books, and I recommend you start with I Have the Watch first. It's filled with 22 short stories that will help you become a leader worth following. It's a quick read, and most people finish it in less than three hours. It's also available on Kindle and Audible, so you can listen in the car or while you're working out. So check out all my books at Amazon or on my website, johnsrenny.com. Well, that is it. Today, we're going to be talking about your company's culture. Now, as a leader, you alone are responsible for establishing and maintaining the culture in your team. So how do you do it? Well, my guest today is Kyle McDowell, and he's going to help us answer that question. He is the author of Begin With We, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence. Now, I love talking to him about organizational cultures, and I know you're going to love this conversation as well. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Kyle McDowell. Kyle is a best-selling author, speaker, and leadership coach. He has nearly three decades of experience leading thousands of employees at some of the largest companies in the U.S. And now he's the author of a new book called Begin With We, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence. I am excited to have him on the show to talk about what it takes to build a culture of excellence. So Kyle, welcome to the show. Hey, John, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. And I'm excited to talk about this. Um, We were talking just before we got started. I wrote a book called All in the Same Boat. You wrote a book called Begin With We. I have a feeling that we're going to agree on a lot of things in this conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. I sure hope so. Hey, hey, John, before we get started, tomorrow is Veterans Day. And I wanted to say thank you for your service, my friend. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, before we started the show, I'm going to take tomorrow off. So I'm going to uh, uh, work from home and uh, take a little bit easy. So uh, well uh, deserved, I'm excited about it. It's nice. But uh, thank you for that. I appreciate deal. it. Sure. So let's yep. talk about uh, you a little bit, a little bit before we get into the book and, and what you uh, what you wrote about. Tell us about um, some of the great companies you work for and some of the highlights of your career experiences before you kind of went into this uh, world of of coaching and speaking and writing. Yeah, yeah, you bet. As you mentioned, I've got nearly 30 years inside of corporate America. And um, I began that journey back at the very young age of 17. Mm-hmm. I applied to work for a local bank here in Florida. Uh, I was 17 at the time, and I rolled the dice that the interview and a job offer might come after my birthday. Um, because, you know, obviously the legal age, uh, yeah. I think then was 18. I believe it still is now. Um, and uh, it worked. So I got the offer and accepted a role with a bank. And, um, you know, I just found myself taking on bigger and bigger roles with uh, a broader scope and scale. And um, and 30 years later, I, um, I've i come to the conclusion that I've got more to offer um, based on the lessons and learnings that I attained um, uh, throughout my journey of corporate America. And as you mentioned, I've been with, um, I was very, very fortunate in many ways uh, to work for some really big companies, uh, three Fortune 10, uh, Bank of America, uh, United Health Group, CVS Health. Um, and nearly every role I ever was fortunate enough to have, um, I always I always felt the emphasis of an on people was my job. 
Mm. Um, so as a leader, uh, regardless if I was leading uh, five or 50 or uh, 15,000, um, I always knew that there was there was something to be said for the leader who spent an inordinate amount of time focusing on the team and the team's needs. Um, so I was really lucky to have have quite the journey. Um, you know, I won't, I, I'm not naive and I won't, I won't mislead you. It wasn't always fun. I mean, I, mm. I went through some periods of time with some, some folks that I would call bosses, not leaders that, um, but you know, in hindsight, they were just as influential to me as some of the more, um, empowering and, and the great leaders that I was fortunate enough to be around. Um, they gave me great examples of what not to do. Yeah. Um, but there was a flavor throughout my career that was almost all service oriented. So I've run huge service operations. So my last gig in corporate America before going out on my own and writing the book uh, was with the was with CVS Health, where I had uh, fifteen thousand employees, a two billion dollar budget, uh, forty plus locations, uh, and a very very important mission to to uh, to help uh, patients and and citizens on their path to better health. Um, ran the world's largest mail order pharmacy for a time. We filled 53 million prescriptions a year. Mm. Um, so th- there was a service component to every single role that I had, especially the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, in, in nearly every one of those roles, um, probably since uh, year 20 in corporate America, were all kind of a transformation in nature. So I had an opportunity to rewrite um, the culture in each of those organizations, which is where I found a lot of passion. And, and frankly, John, I get so much more satisfaction out of developing great leaders than any KPI I've ever um, achieved. So, you know, I think that's probably the way I would describe the great journey that I've had. I'm a very, very lucky guy. And mm-hmm. I'm now trying to kind of transition from, from that first chapter into the second chapter of my career. And that's paying back all the great les- uh, lessons that I learned. Uh, and that was part of the reason for writing the book is to get to get these messages out as wide and as far as I can. I love it. I have a very similar story, so I love to hear this. Um, you know, you mentioned that you 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 had a passion for people. You had a passion for cultures and and leadership development. Do you know where that came from? You know, I mean, I, I it's interesting because I know where my where my passion came from. But I and I as I talk to people on the podcast, I get get it from different areas. Sometimes it's a grandfather. Sometimes it's a a boss that they work for. Sometimes it's just you know, it, it comes from different places. So I'm curious about you, where your passion came from. Yeah. Yeah. So I was taught at a very young age by a single mother um, who who was a really hard worker. The golden rule was huge in our family. Just mm. we, we, we knew treating people and I was from a very young age. I knew treating people was uh, in a way that um, showed respect um, was, was really something that we were, my sister and I were both, um, we learned at a very, very young age, but I tell you one of the more formative, formative experiences for me was I've, I've played, or back in those days, I played football Hmm. and I played, I played the quarterback position. And I knew that if I didn't want to end up on my butt, every single play, I had to rally the team around me to do their jobs. And, um, and I think thirdly, John, there was a, I was raised in a very, very middle-class family, but I was also um, exposed to um, many, many of my friends at that time. I grew up in a very, very rural area, um, were not as fortunate as I was. And I would, again, classify myself as middle-class. So I had this hardworking mom who taught me the value of work ethic. I was in sports, so I knew teamwork was very, very important. And I could see around me that not, not everybody had the same kind of benefits that I had. Um, mm-hmm. So it was easy to me to see where uh, those less fortunate than me were just as important as I was, mattered as much, smarter than me in most cases. Um, so I recognized the value of people, um, serving people, making people better than they were the day before or helping them anyway. And it's just been a passion of mine ever since. I love it. That's great to hear. I, I, in fact, I, you know, you you mentioned respect first, and you know that's the number one uh, rule at our company: treat everyone with respect. It's the number one rule. It's Amen. it's been you know what I've what I've lived by all these years, and so it's good to hear you you know hearken to that same kind of uh, idea, and you know helping other people, you know pe- treating people with respect, and uh, I absolutely love that. So, yeah. blue collar yeah. work ethic yeah. uh, that's that's important, right? I mean, it's a big part of 
uh, you know, when I say what I'll say is becoming a leader worth following is like, you know, when you're showing respect and you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to invest in your people, those are the skills that that make you a leader worth following. So I love I love hearing all this is fantastic. Um, you know, why did you decide now to 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 make a shift from corporate to go out on your own? Uh, what's what was there? There was there one thing that 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 said it's time for me to do this, uh, or was it a gradual thing over time? Yeah, no, it was a it was a there was a sentinel moment, maybe two. So, um, the book. Let me start there for a moment because I think that will and I'll come yeah. full circle. But so the book is begin with we. Uh, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence. And um, I would say it was probably uh, 2015, 2016. Um, I, I had kind of an epiphany. I I just left an organization where I, I had a, a boss, not a leader. I had a boss that um, just just didn't inspire me or bring bring the best out of me. And I felt myself becoming a bit apathetic about corporate America in general. So I told myself if I was ever given the opportunity to lead an organization with complete autonomy, I was going to lead it very differently. I was going to lead in a way that I always wanted to be led. And I had 20-ish years in corporate America at that time. And as I mentioned, I was able to pull some of the bad experiences in, in my toolbox to, as examples of what not to do. And I had a handful of really great leaders and mentors. So I had a good combination, I felt, of what not to do and what worked and kind of what, what worked for me um, be, being led. Well, um, you know, it turned out to be, be careful what you wish for, because in 2016, I was given a role, um, I landed a role in one of the most impactful uh, parts or periods of my career where I was um, responsible for leading about 14,000 oh, wow. customer care professionals who were responsible for um, all the enrollment functions for the Affordable Care Act, as well as 1-800-MEDICARE. Uh, 11 locations, it was a $6 billion program. And um, when I joined that organization, I was made aware pretty quickly that um, my predecessor led in a way that wasn't very inspiring, mm. um, a very me focused individual um, who really ruled by fear and intimidation. Um, so when I when I took the role, I thought it was a real gut check moment for me. I thought this is the time that I've I've longed for. I'm going to I'm going to lead very differently, um, very authentically less bureaucratically, uh, but most of all, with an eye on the people, an eye on the team, because I knew it was an, it was an organization I wasn't super familiar with, and it certainly wasn't a domain, the Affordable Care Act and uh, 1-800-Medicare that I was super familiar with. So I needed that team to bring me up to speed on the domain. Um, and I felt like I had an opportunity to, to lend them uh, some of the expertise that I'd picked up as, as a leader throughout the previous uh, couple dozen years. Well, um, the night before I was about to meet with uh, about 50 leaders of that of that organization, I sat in my hotel room in Lawrence, Kansas, and I had no idea what I was going to say. Uh, I love it. But it was it was that gut check moment. It said, OK, bud, this is what you wanted. Now you have the opportunity. Are you all talk or can you really do this? Mm -hmm. So that night in about three hours, I I, I scribbled on my laptop um, that ultimately ended up with 10 sentences. And each of those sentences started with the word we. Yeah. Um, and I'm not that smart, so or creative rather. So I said I got ten sentences. They all start with we. We have the ten we's. So the next morning, I stepped out um, in front of the crowd and and walked them through each of those what what I later coined as guiding principles because um, it occurred to me um, a principle really is a foundational belief. It's something that we hold to be true, and I felt if I could get the team to rally around these principles. Uh, and we have a shared set of beliefs, how we treat each other and how we treat those we serve, we would be really, we'd be positioned for success. And maybe uh, I could squash some of that negative leadership that they had been exposed to. Um, I was with that organization for about three years. And John, man, uh, the cultural transformation and the impact it had on so many people, including me, is is so, so profound. I left that organization um, to take a to take the role at CVS that I mentioned earlier, and um, I didn't have the same experience. Uh, mm. The culture was not as open and inviting and open uh, to transformation. Um, uh, I was hired to lead a transformation, um, but it's a big engine. 
Uh, and it's a big machine trying to move and it didn't move very fast. And after about a year, I, I, I realized it just wasn't for me. So to answer the question more directly and a little more succinctly, uh, that, that was when I knew I had a lot to give, but it had to be to organizations that were really thirsty or hungry for change. Mm. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't really my decision candidly, um, so when I left CVS, I was in a position where I had to make a choice. I was at a crossroad. Do I go back into corporate America where I'd had really great success? Um, or do I take these principles that have been so powerful for me and so many others and try to, to, to get them out, to get them out into the universe and see what happened? Well, um, as I was debating the option to take on a new role, I started to get phone calls from, from my direct reports, from colleagues and others. Uh, throughout the, the entire course of my career, but most notably the last few years where I rolled out those principles and they said, Kyle, you, you, you've you talked all along about how important these principles are and we've shown you how much they mean to us. You got to take this more broad. You got to go out and you got to write a book. Yeah. Um, so there were, you know, I went from this low period where the CVS gig didn't work out the way I had hoped to such inspiration and motivation from people that at that point, I could tell they genuinely cared about my next step and um, they propelled me and compelled me to put the book together. So the book was really the first step of just, I thought I'd write the book. I thought I'd sell a few copies, maybe yeah. a couple hundred copies. Um, but man, um, so humbled to share that it's, it's become a USA today, bestseller, a wall street journal, bestseller uh, actually hit um, bestseller status in nine different categories on Amazon Nice. Um, so then I thought, okay, this is really the gut check time. Um, I've got to put a business together, take this show on the road. And that's what I've been up to the last year or so. I love it. That's so good to hear. Uh, and, and it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, I read in, in your book, you know, that story of you writing those, the 10 we's and I, and I, you know, and, and, in you know, I, I imagine that when you were writing those for, for that meeting that you had, that you never expected that you would end up writing the book and then, you know, doing this now full time. I imagine that was probably a bit of a surprise to you as you look back. on John, it. I hadn't, I had no idea. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't even know that the principles, I didn't even call them principles until the, until maybe a day or two later. And I, um, I even told the team because you have to, you have to understand, man, when I'm giving this presentation to these 40 or 50 people, about half the crew was open I would say a quarter of them not open at all. <laughs> and the last quarter were just kind of skeptical. They were, you could just read it on their faces. And I was, and I was really uncertain that I had done anything that was, you know, would resonate. Um, uh, but ultimately I learned they did resonate, but I was very clear. I did not want those principles to be words on a wall. I didn't want the, I didn't want a hollow mission statement. I wanted this to be something we could really subscribe to. And yeah. I told the team, if you if you want to create an eleventh we we can do that. If you want to have five we's, I don't care. But the point is, these are non negotiables. By the way, the entire presentation was in black and white on purpose, black background, white letters, because this is not negotiable. Um, and we'll talk about the we's. I hope here in a little bit. But the point is, is they are really tough to refute, and they they become kind of a cultural currency, yeah. uh, where everyone has the same value. The currency has the same value. And regardless of, you know, for the newest intern or the CEO, everyone has the same obligation to use these principles every single day. Um, and I'm happy to admit, by the way, I left that organization back in 2019. The WEs are still the cultural manifesto for that organization. They have the WE Awards twice a year. And they actually even had me back to deliver a keynote back in August, again, many, many years after I left. I so I, I think it just shows you how how well it's resonated and it's stuck, um, which is so humbling to me because as you mentioned and as you alluded to or questioned, I had no idea <laughs> this was going to end up where it has. None, I love it. But I'm so and, grateful. You know, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're all your experiences up to that point and then you were about to embark on something different and you wanted to change the culture. You took all those experiences and you put it into one, 10, 10 phrases right. that ended up. That's right. 
resonating because but it didn't come from yeah. you being uh a, a, you were an experienced leader at that point and you knew what it what you wanted to do and that came out of all that experience so it's really that i love that part of it and i love the story in the book uh the way you write it so let's talk about the book i love it it's called begin with we 10 principles for building and sustaining a culture of excellence um these in the book, you're 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 covering these ten uh, the ten we's and uh, each of the chapter you cover the ten we's, which I love the way you're doing it. Um, let's talk about some of those because I think they're really interesting to talk about. So um, let's say uh, one of the things you have is we lead by example. So what does that look like? Yeah. In uh, how do you how do you phrase it? And, and what does that mean? Yeah, so I think it's important to note the the very first we you mentioned we too. The very first we is we do the right thing. Yeah. Always. And I never I never leave out that second one word sentence always because as you know uh, throughout your experiences the right thing can be very subjective and what yeah. some people view as the right thing one day the scenario or situation might change slightly or perhaps the waters have gotten a little rougher and the right thing now is a little bit different. So there's no negotiation there. The second we is the one that you're asking about, and and I think it's an absolute perfect kind of uh, 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 bookend to the first one, and that is if we're going to do the right thing always, we're going to lead by example. Mm-hmm. We must lead by example, and and as you know, you're already leading by example. Uh, it, the choice is, or the question is, are you leading by an example that you'd be proud for others to follow? Is it an example that would create followership? Is it an example that your mother would be proud? of the way your behavior, you're, you're behaving. If it made the press, would you be ashamed of your behavior? Are you leading in a way that inspires others to do the exact same things? Pay forward how, how, how attentive you are to the team. Pay forward how selfless you are. Pay forward how you empower the team, how you inspire them. So it's a choice that all leaders have to make is do you want to lead by example? Uh, and, and by the way, that example is something that you're proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, it, it 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 ranges from very big scenarios to very small scenarios. A silly example that I always talk about is if I'm walking through the hallway of the office and I've got my head down on my phone, and a team member's walking by, and I don't lift up to say hello. Well, what example have I set? I've told the person you're not important enough to just give you an eye contact or say hello or give you a smile because what's going on in here is more important. That's not the example I want to be known for. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. This podcast is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger Fitness. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. But how do you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best person for the job. Now, don't struggle on your own. Put Jeremy Clevenger on your team. Jeremy will work with you to help take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. Now, I've worked with Jeremy for the past year, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So if you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at jeremyclevengerfitness.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. They live by a simple philosophy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. Yeah, I was going to say, I love that you tell that story because... I actually experienced this as, as a as a plant manager one time, 
I had an employee come to me and say, you know, I just want to let you know that one of your managers, he, he, he doesn't really care about us. Uh, you know, every, he's always busy. He's got his head down. He doesn't seem to care. And when he told me the name of the, the manager, he's, he's the guy that cares, cares the most about the employees, but it was just, uh, he was one of these guys that was always thinking about his next thing. And so he would keep his head down as he walked through the plant. So they wouldn't get interrupted because he was always busy and working on the next project. And so, yeah. but the message he sent as he walked through the shop, right head down was you're not important. I don't have time for you. I, I'm working on other things that are more important than you. And, and the truth is, he was a guy that really did care, but it was the body language. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's why I love what you just said. The idea of you're down on your phone, your phone's more important than the person in front of you. Yeah. So I love that. The, yeah. and, just, and, and people are watching us as leaders all the time. And just those little things that we do. Uh, our mannerisms and and how we react when they when they're nearby they're they're noticing every little thing that we do you're under a microscope 24/7 yeah. uh especially to in today's world right um everyone's got a cell phone everyone's got a camera um you're always under the microscope and it and I'm not naive john it's um and I don't want to come across pollyannish or you know, all unicorns and rainbows um <laughs> it it takes work uh, um, yeah. It takes work to put on that smile. I have this gut check every time I walk into the office and I tell myself, I literally, this is every day. I literally tell myself, smile. Yeah. Do I feel like smiling every single day that I walk in? Of course I don't. But that example, the way that I behave and how people perceive the energy that I'm giving off yeah. will be replicated. So yeah. I would much rather be known for the guy that's always smiling, maybe a little corny at times. Than the guy that's always down on his phone with the scowl. And I, because I think that gets replicated and yep. replayed over and over more times than we're ever aware of as leaders. Oh, yeah. Colin Powell would say that uh, attitude is contagious. And I do truly believe that. So if we're, even when we're Absolutely. not, even though we're not feeling it, we need to, we're on stage. You're on stage all the that's time right. and you've got to be on stage and you have to be, you have to be positive. I mean, I think you have to be authentic. You know, you can't be faking it. You know, you have to have authentic reactions to problems and things. But yes. uh, the truth of the matter is, you yes. generally have to be upbeat, positive, and and uh, and, th- right. and 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 focus on the visions that you're heading heading towards, and not just being dragged down into the problems of the present, but keep everybody focused on the That's vision right. and where we're headed. Yeah, I love that. That's right. John used the word. Such an important part. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's one of my favorites. And you mentioned a word that I really use a lot, and that's authentic, authenticity. Because, you know, there's it, there's there's a difference between smiling and being positive, uh, and being authentic. Um, I I my team knows when I'm disappointed. They know when I'm upset. They know when I'm mad. I don't hide any of those things um, because that would be less than authentic. So, um, but but when you're walking through a crowd or you're on stage or you know whatever the environment is. You've got to, you've got to, um, you, you, you must portray, um, uh, confidence, but it's also, it, it needs to be authentic confidence. So when I don't know the answer, I say, I don't know, yeah. uh, let me get back to you or let me look into that for you. I don't, I rarely have all the answers, but that's why you, you know, you try to find and hire people that are smarter than you know more about the work than you do. And then it's my job just to remove the barriers to allow them to be great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> such a such powerful word. I don't even want to add anything to it. It's just so perfect. <laughs> so one of the things you have in there, you say, uh, we pick each other up. I love this. What does that mean? Yeah. So again, I think the uh, preceding we is really important to, to give you some context before we go to that one. And that's we own our mistakes. So we five is we own our mistakes. Yep. I think it's really important to create an environment where uh, the team is comfortable enough to say, I blew it. They're comfortable enough to raise their hand and say, I need help. They're comfortable enough to say, you know, I've got some stuff going outside of work and it's probably impacting my work product, but boss or leader, I I need your help. So if we expect people to raise their hand when they make a mistake and and call for help, then we must be in a position to pick them up. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, and that's, we six, we pick each other up. And there are two components to that, John, that I'm really adamant about. And the first is the obvious one. And that's when someone's stumbling or they've erred. You know, maybe they're down. There's something going on outside of work that's that's contributing to to kind of a um, a slip in their behavior or their performance. You got as a leader, you got to pick them up. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, it's and it's it's really literally extending a hand, extending a hand, um, literally at times that's required. Um, but also just reaffirming that 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 
They are the person that you need in that role. They're the person that you believe in uh, and they add value to the organization. But the second part I think is just as important. And that is it's the leader's obligation to pick the person up and propel them to new heights. And yeah. so what does that mean? So if you're down, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to get you back to where uh, we we know you can be. But also, once you're at that point, it's my responsibility as your leader to help you find a new height. And that can be a promotion within my team. It can be a promotion within our organization. It can even be a job outside of our company, which a lot of people don't don't necessarily subscribe to that theory. I, I see it very differently. And it's there's a story I'll tell, a very brief one, that is why I feel this way. Um, at one point in my career, I, I um, and this was not too not too long ago, had an employee, a, a fella on the team who was looking at a role outside of the organization. And because I'd created this open and candid environment where we were allowed to share anything, he came to me and he said, I've got this job opportunity. I'm in, I'm in talks with them, big raise for him, big increase in scope. I, if I'm, if I am the we oriented leader that I profess to be, I have one response to that. And that's how can I help you? How can I help you land that role? Well, in this scenario, he didn't get the job. But how do you think he performed when he came back to my team, realizing that that role wasn't going to happen? His dedication and commitment to me was was tenfold before he looked into that opportunity because he knew now I had proven to him I was more interested in his performance, his growth, um, and his development than I was my own, than I was the team. He's a star on our team, but he wanted to do something different. And I felt like I'd be an incredible hypocrite if I didn't help him get to that role. Unfortunately, he didn't get the role, but he came back and has been promoted with us since then. Um, so it's been, that, that I feel like if you're going to pick someone up, you can't do one without the other or else you're a hypocrite. If I pick you up, but I don't propel you forward, I must only care about getting you back to where your performance is to benefit us. But if I pick you up and propel you forward, I care about you. Yeah, I love it. That's a, such a great that's a, such a great uh, lesson in this book, and it's one I talk about a lot when I speak to college students. I I tell the story of a boss that had my back. I was I was a young R and D engineer, and we failed at a test lab. We had we built a prototype. We went to the test lab. We were doing something that's never been done before, and the first test. We, we spent a lot of money getting this product there and, and and the product blew up and I was the lead mechanical engineer I was the I was uh, running the test program uh -oh. and I remember I had to call my boss back at at, at our you know at the at the headquarters and and uh, I had to tell him we, we failed the test and I remember he just had two questions for me he says do you know what happened and and I did I knew right away how we failed and why we failed and I said yeah and he and he said, uh, can you fix it? And I, and I knew right away what I needed to do to fix it. I said, absolutely. He says, great. He said, get back here. Let's get the redesign done and get back up to the test lab as quick as we can. And instead of like my career wow. ending at that point, it, he, yeah. he picked me up, right? And he gave me a new mission, which was to redesign yeah. and get back to the test lab. And uh, even though I know that he took heat over this this failure, he never he 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 kept me he shielded me from that heat and he's picked me yeah. up and put me in a new direction and the point is is that i tell the story this happened 30 years ago and i still tell the story it's that was in my, my next books. question i still i still tell this to college students every time i talk to them about what the role yeah. their roles need to be as leaders and and this idea and like you said too is i i would run through a wall for that guy after that experience Love right it. Because yes. because he picked me up, yes. put me on a new path, and and he didn't, yes. uh, and he knew what I was doing had never been done before, and so there was a risk that there would be a failure. But instead of like you know throwing me under a bus, he took the heat, and he shielded me, and he said, "I'll, I'll give you cover. Yeah. Essentially, let's get this thing redesigned and get back and get back to the lab." It turns out product. The product was the first in the industry. We we set all these records, all these global patent awards, and and millions of dollars because we developed something had never been done before. And uh, but it was because he had my back. And I think that's a really important lesson in this book uh, and in this and uh, what you're doing. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a that's an excellent. Uh, well, you know, I love that story. I, I I love the story you just shared, and I think it highlights something that we touched on earlier, and that's the impact that the leader has without even knowing it. Right. Yeah. You're talking about the story from 30 years ago, man. Right. It had such an impact <laughs> on you. You're still and it made it to your book. Um, you know, that's I just think that's a beautiful thing to be able to say. And and anytime 
you know, if someone's telling that story and you're in that leadership role, boy, what a great feeling. I, I just think it's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it's it's it, it's just an example of what your principles that you're putting out in these books, I've experienced them, I've seen them in real life, and, and they do make a difference. They make a powerful difference. The idea of we versus I is such an important part of this book that I that I'm really glad that you put this out. Uh let's take one more and then that before we wrap up. Uh and and so I have a uh, I do this thing in my books. I, uh, I talk about run to the fire. So so I was, I'm a trained firefighter in the Navy, right? But you say we take action. So I, I want to hear what you say about that. We take action. Yeah, man. So um we take action. The spirit behind we take action is you know, there's this there's this malaise inside a lot of organizations, especially really big ones that that um, really smart people see problems but don't do anything about it because yeah. if they stumble, if they fail, they're gonna get smacked around. Yeah, there's gonna be retribution. There's gonna be you know, like like the scenario you just described, right? If you fail, if you make a mistake, you're gonna get fired. So yeah. why should I put my neck out? Why should I try something different? Why should I take action? Because there's no incentive for me to do that. The, the biggest companies in, in the world, at least the ones that I've been associated with, they are littered with people that do a great job keeping their head down, don't rock the boat, and continue to perpetuate the status quo. But I, I, I'll I, tell you, in a culture of excellence, if you really want to deliver a great product or service, if you want to have a team that's really committed to that great product or service, you've got to give them the opportunity to take action. Mm. And said very, very simply, if you see something, do something. You know, in the business that I've been in, uh, I've done a lot of work in the call center space. and I've seen this scenario that I'm about to share countless times. So when a new hire comes in, they go through training and they go through something that's called nesting. And it's basically OJT. It's on the job training. They leave the training room. They come down. They sit with um, a tenured call center person shoulder to shoulder. And I've seen this so many times. The tenured person will say, you know, they tell us to do it this way, but I'm going to tell you exactly the right. I'm going to tell you how we do it just to get to get this done, right? Well, that is a perfect example of someone not taking action. So we have a team that knows that the way that we do things isn't the right or the most efficient way. But no one's raising their hand to say, well, this isn't right. We have to change it. So what happens? Mediocrity abound. And everything is kind of a, a click below where it could be or should be because no one's taking the initiative to say, hey, we got to take action because this thing ain't working. Um, so it's really about that. If you see an opportunity in a culture of excellence, if you see an opportunity, you are obligated to point it out. Now, the leader can say, we're not going to do anything about that. They should always explain why we're not going to do anything about it. But to let it sit in a corner somewhere without addressing it or at least acknowledging it, um, that is perpetuating the status quo. And that's not excellent in my book. I love it. That's great. And that's and that's why all this tribal knowledge kind of grows out of organizations, because we don't actually elevate those problems to a point where we can solve it. So everybody's doing it the same way in the well right said. way and the well most said. efficient way. So yep. that, that's absolutely yep, that's right. That's right, John. Well, yep. this has been this has been fantastic. Uh, so, Kyle, how can people find out more about uh, about you, your company, what you do and then this this new book that's uh, that's out there? Sure. So I'm available on all social platforms at, at Kyle McDowell Inc. The website is uh, kylemcdowellinc.com. We've talked about the book, Begin With We. And John, I got to tell you, man, as, as cliche or as corny as it might sound, since I made the decision for this second chapter of my life or of my career, it's my purpose. I'm absolutely yeah. committed and dedicated to evangelizing these principles because I've seen them work. I've seen people find fulfillment, passion, um, and be so rewarded for work that they once found um, themselves being so disenfranchised and apathetic about. The beauty of principles, and, and I'm the first to admit, is these principles, they're not rocket science. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing very inflammatory here, but the beauty of them is when you combine them into a series of beliefs that we all agree to subscribe to and we align around them, they fuel the organization. And they give us a series of guideposts that that kind of dictate how we react when faced with adversity or how how we react when we're we're faced with challenges. Um, so that's my goal. It's my purpose. Um, so I've been doing a lot of speaking, a lot of podcasts, and obviously trying to promote the book to get the word out there. And is again, as cliche as it sounds, it's not about it's not about money. It's not about trying to sell a bunch of books. It's about trying to sell the message. 
because I truly believe there's there's a better corporate America to be had if we all subscribe to something that we all can believe in together. Absolutely right. Wow. Amen to that one. <laughs> I truly believe in that, that that same exact thing. Absolutely. So the book is Begin With We, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence. Highly recommend it. Go out there, get this book. Um, if you want to really make a difference, these are the principles. And I love how you've laid it out, 10, 10 simple principles, and you tell the, the stories behind them and, and how they can be effective. I encourage everyone that's listening in, get this book, read it, and then really, you know, use these principles to, to lead your business and to build a culture of excellence in your own company. Kyle, thank you for coming on the show, sharing this wisdom, such powerful words. And, and, uh, and it's so uh, consistent with, with what I've experienced as well in all my years in corporate and, and now as an entrepreneur. So, so thanks for coming on the show and thanks for sharing this great book. It's my pleasure, truly, John. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Reddy saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. If you're a working professional wondering what's next for your career, you've come to the right place. Whether you're looking for a promotion, growth, or a potential career transition, look no further. With over 30 years working in a variety of industries, I share my insider knowledge with those ready to get ahead on Career Advancement with Craig Ansell. Tune in to get your strategies for success. Are you a fan of classic cinema or a young person who wants to discover the best films of all time? Do these legendary movies still hold up? On the Generation Film Podcast, two guys who grew up when movies dominated the culture share a great film with a panel of young movie lovers and see how it plays for today's generation. We discuss changes in storytelling, styles, representation, and the making of each film, its initial reception, and how its meaning has changed over the years. Join us as we explore cinema classics across generations on Generation Film. Electric acid.